Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the another edition of Live with Your Lobbyist here from the Capitol in Helena. I'm Chelsea Cargill, and I will be visiting with you this week. We'll give folks just a couple seconds here to jump on if there's anybody that wants to, to bail on and watch us while we give our live update. It's been um, still a pretty quiet week here at the legislative session. There are beginning to be a few more bills moving that Farm Bureau is working on. We did have our first Calling on the Capitol event in Helena this week where we had a group of young farmers and ranchers with us and it was a great group. I really enjoyed being able to be with them for the two days that they were here and tour around and, and sit in on their meetings. We had great meetings with both the Department of Livestock and the Department of Agriculture and got some great time before Governor Bullock with this group. And I really want to just give a shout out to our group because they really made the most of their time with Governor Bullock. They asked great questions and engaged in some really thoughtful conversation about agriculture in Montana and really represented our industry and Farm Bureau so, so well. So shout out to you guys. Thanks for making the trip up here and I hope Hope that you had as much fun in Helena as we do all the time when we're here. So we will get going today. I have kind of a brief update for you. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, that usually never happens, but we'll see what we can do. So a few bills that we're going to talk about this week are mostly House bills. We didn't spend very much time in the Senate this week, which is kind of rare, but here we go, nonetheless. So we kicked the week off in the House Ag Committee with uh, House Bill 256, which was carried by Representative Casey Knutson, who is from Malta. And what House Bill 256 did was define what constitutes a legal fence in Montana law. During the 2015 session, our fence statutes were opened up and amended to clarify that a, an electric fence can in fact be a legal form of offense. However, there wasn't ever any criteria really developed that would assert what needed to be part of that electric fence to make it legal. So what Rep Representative Knutson did was add a few criteria to that definition. So for example, it will have to consist of three or more electrified wires. It will have to be set on posts firmly in the ground that are spaced no more than 30 feet apart and have sufficient charge for the duration of the fence. Farm Bureau did support this bill, but we kind of supported it with a caveat. We spoke with the sponsor, Representative Knutson, who was more than amenable to our questions and actually brought an amendment himself. And where our biggest issue is, is with his specific distancing on the post spacing. We feel like that is a little bit too specific and could be prohibitive in a lot of instances where folks are using electric fence along boundaries. Uh, a thing to remember here is that this statute would only apply to boundary fences between property lines. So what you do internally on your property for divvying up pastures or managing grazing rotations, none of that would be affected by this law at all. This is strictly regarding boundary fences. But we asked Representative Knutson to please maybe amend that 30 foot spacing requirement out, which he is intending to do and said as much in his opening and closing of the bill. And it's going to reflect some more um, guidelines that are commonly associated with some of the electric fence guidelines that the NRCS uses. And that gives us more of a, an average of 50 to 60 feet of post spacing. And we think that's pretty important because as we all know, when you're building fence, we never just get to build fence in a straight line. And if you're building across a waterway, if you are building up and down very steep draws or over difficult terrain, we all know that it's very, very difficult to keep your post spacing exact and sometimes impossible. And you need to be able to have the flexibility to get those fences up. So we did support that bill with that amendment, our caveat being we would like to see that amendment there. And we're confident that that will get there as well. Another bill that we worked on earlier in the week was House Bill 286. This bill was carried by Representative Ray Shaw and this bill intends to add mountain lands to the list of predators that livestock owners can be um, eligible to receive reimbursement for if livestock predation occurs. So currently in Montana law and under the Livestock Loss Board, grizzly bears and wolves are the only two predators that we are eligible to receive reimbursement for when predation occurs. 
And House Bill 286 moves to add mountain lions to that list as well. Farm policy supports adding mountain lions to that list. While mountain lions are not on the Endangered Species Act, they are a relatively regulated species and in some areas you must draw permits in order to hunt them. In all areas in Montana, you must have a license to hunt them and in some areas it's harder than others to receive it. And we all know that they can be devastating on livestock if invasion does occur. So we did support that bill and we'll be following it through the process as well. Moving on a little bit later into the week, we worked on some sage grouse funding as well in House Bill 228 with Representative Jim Keene. And this bill addresses the Montana Sage Grouse Conservation and Stewardship Act, which was created in the 2015 session. And in the 2015 session, there was a $10 million appropriation made to that account for sage grouse conservation. What House Bill 228 will do is basically just sort of reorganizes that funding. Instead of just giving it the $10 million appropriation like we received last time, what they're going to do is just divvy up how the conservation program receives that funding and it will be reallocated at $2 million every two years throughout um, the next four years. And that really is not going to impact or jeopardize any sage grouse conservation efforts in the state of Montana. It was just something that needed to be done uh, mostly for budgeting reasons. So Farm Bureau did support that because our bottom line in this conversation is not necessarily how the program is funded, but ensuring that we secure that funding to make sure we continue to do the work here in Montana to keep the, keep the sage grouse off the Endangered Species Act. We all know that Montana's farm and ranch families have the most to lose if sage grouse are put on the Endangered Species Act. So we want to make sure that we can keep management of that bird in, uh, this, in state hands here in Montana. And a bill that we actually opposed this week, this will be the one and only bill that we opposed this week, but we really, really didn't like this one. Uh, it's House Bill 243, and it was carried by a, a representative, Jacobson, from Great Falls. And essentially what this bill would have done, or will propose to do, is to make it unlawful for a private landowner to allow an outfitter to cross their private property to access a piece of state trust land if that state trust land is not open to the public. So let's talk just a little bit about state trust lands in Montana. State trust lands are managed by the Department of Natural Resources in trust for the state. And those lands first and foremost job is to bring in revenue for a variety of beneficiaries, including many educational systems around the state of Montana. They're often referred to as school trust lands because that money goes to benefit schools in Montana. So anybody who leases trust lands for grazing, um, for an egg lease, which is often farming, uh, or even an outfitting lease, which um, you do pay for, for an outfitting license on state lands, you pay that money into the straight state trust, which then in turn is divvied back into education systems. And we also know in Montana that we have a lot of checkerboarded ownership. And there's a lot of times state leases that may be entirely landlocked by private inholdings around them. Doesn't necessarily always mean it's the same landowner. It could be entirely landlocked, but it could be landlocked by a different landowner on each of the four sides. And so this is a really um, dangerous precedent to be setting in the state of Montana. First and foremost, it's a gross violation of private property rights. Um, one of the major uh, or one of the first tenets of private property rights is as a landowner, you get to say who does and doesn't have permission to cross your land. It's not dictated by state law. And secondly, we think that it just sets a dangerous precedent for utilizing these state lands to, again, control what landowners can do. Um, a second thing that this bill would do is it would actually make the private landowner criminally liable if they did let an outfitter cross their private land to access state lands. And that landowner would be would be um, eligible to be fined no less than $500 per section of leased state land. So again, before I oppose this bill, 
kill. Uh, fundamentally, it is a violation of private property rights, which is one of the major priorities and, and foundational pillars of what our organization is built on and is something that is vitally important to the success and the continued expansion and growth of agriculture in the state and Montana's farm and ranch families. So we'll continue to track that bill through the process as well. And if anybody has questions about that, you can either comment here. Um, I do realize that I haven't paused very much to ask if there's any questions, sorry. So if anyone does have a question, please uh, throw it out there in the comments. If I don't get back to you live, I will respond to you in the comment section. You can send us a Facebook message. You can send me an email. Um, all that information is on our website at www.mfbf.org. But again, we're always here to help answer your questions as well. And the final bill that I want to mention to everybody today is a bill we testified on actually on Monday. So it was very early in the week and it is House Bill 110, which is carried by Senator Brad Hamlet. And this is actually kind of a bit of a reminder and um, something that a lot of farmers and ranchers and our members, anybody that's got a water right really needs to be paying attention to. What House Bill 110 did was set the deadline for filing or um, yet yeah, filing on rights that used to be exempt from filing. So we'll talk about that for just, just a minute here. So within the Department of Natural Resources, certain water rights are considered exempt from the filing or exempt from filing for a permit process. Those include most commonly things like domestic wells and stock water use usually in-stream flow stock water use. So if you have a creek that runs through a pasture, you've got a ditch that once runs through your pasture and you have historically watered your livestock there. And what we really want folks to do is to actually be filing those rights with DNRC because we do know that, that as the adjudication process in Montana continues and as there continues to be increased demands on Montana's water, in order to make sure that your rights aren't compromised, DNRC does need to know that they exist. And so the deadline is for that has been set. It was extended to, I believe, February 28th, 2019. And this bill is kind of a follow-up bill to one that was brought in the 2015 session as well. DNRC will be sending out public notice. They have to do so by July, at least once before July of 2017. So all you water users out there, please be aware of this. Please be cognizant of it. If you have rights that are exempt from filing, like I said, those domestic wells, those in-stream stock water uses, uh, be paying attention to this. Now, I do want to clarify that if you don't get your right filed with Department of Natural Resources by that deadline, it does not mean that you have abandoned your water right. So I don't want you to think you're going to lose your water right because you will not. But what will happen is if you do miss that deadline and you haven't filed and somebody else comes in and goes through the process and files on some of your in-stream flow stock water, you don't lose your right, but you do become subordinate to that user. And so it is really important that water users are paying attention to this because there may be, for example, in dry years, a time where if someone did file on that right, uh, you may be out of water in a pasture because they filed and, and you did it. So while you don't lose that right, there's definitely worth looking into to make sure that your ability to use that water is not compromised at some point in the future. We did ask the committee and the bill sponsor to please consider extending that deadline to file out to June of 2019. The reason we did that was twofold. One, it matches up with the end of the fiscal year for all of the state budgeting and financial stuff. And there are, of course, fees associated with getting this work done through DNRC. But secondly, what that does is it gives us one more legislative session to take a look at this issue because we want to make sure that proper notice is given. We want to make sure that all water users know that they need to be looking into this and doing their due diligence to protect their water rights. So we can have another opportunity to revisit this next session in 2019 and evaluate the amount of notice that was given, the awareness that membership organizations like Farm Bureau are able to create among their members and gauge whether or not we feel there's really been adequate time for 
members to engage in the process and for DNRC to handle the workload that may result from people filing these rights. So that's something that water users really need to be aware of going forward. We did support the bill because we do think we need a deadline and we do want folks to have time to be able to file on these rights. So again, if you've got any questions about that, please just shout them out there, throw them out there. That's all I've got for you this week. We are shaping up next week to be spending quite a bit of time in the Appropriations Committee. We will be listening in on the Department of Livestock Budgets hearing, also testifying in support of their budget and the work and the importance of what the, what the department does. Additionally, we will be listening in and supporting the MSU extension and the Ag uh, Research Station budgets as well next week. Those hearings, I believe, begin towards the end of next week as well. So we do have a few things to be covering next week we already know of, and so we'll be back again next Friday with another update for you all. In the meantime, like I said, please do let us know if you have questions. We're happy to help you figure out answers to them. If you've got questions on how to contact your legislator, uh, we can also assist with doing some of that as well. So I hope everybody's got a great day and we will talk to you again next week. Bye.